Is the far right and its nativism ascendant or in decline? Have such movements already succeeded when mainstream parties shoplift their policies? Welcome to Connections, the Arab Studies Institute's interview program on current events, policy questions, and new ideas. I'm Wain Rabbani, and for this episode, we're delighted to be speaking with Goss Midde. Goss Midde is a political scientist and global authority on populism and political extremism, particularly the European and American far right. He's a Stanley Wade Shelton professor at the University of Georgia School of Public and International Affairs, and also holds the rank of professor at the University of Oslo Center for Research on Extremism. The co-founder and convener of the Standing Group on Extremism and Democracy of the European Consortium for Political Research, Müde is a prolific author whose books include The Far Right in America, The Far Right Today, and the Israeli settler movement, assessing and explaining social movement success. He is also a columnist for The Guardian and runs the highly regarded Radical podcast. Professor Kosmide, it's a real pleasure to welcome you to Connections. Thank you for having me. Um, you've written about the importance of distinguishing between concepts like populism, extremism, and nativism. Could you give a brief overview of the distinctions between them and the extent to which they overlap in your study of the far right? Yes, very simply stated, I, I tend to use the term far right to describe both the extreme right and the radical right. Now, the radical right accepts democracy in its most essential form as in a combination of popular sovereignty and majority rule, which by and large just holds that the people elect their own leaders. Mm -hmm. However, they have problems with liberal democracy, which are specific aspects as the separation of powers, the independence of judiciary media and minority rights. Now the extreme right or extremism in general <clears throat> doesn't accept democracy per se. And so, like they don't believe that people should elect their own leaders. Populism, I see as um, an ideology which divides the people in two categories or society in two categories. The pure people on the one hand and the corrupt elite on the other and who want politics to be the expression of what they consider to be the general will of the people. Now in theory, Populism is democratic in the sense that it wants majority rule. It wants and can be that. either right or left wing. If, if I'm yes, as, as can be extremism or radicalism. Um, and so populism tends to be combined with the radical right, not the extreme right. In practice, though, we do see that some populist politicians push forward pol politics that, that are actually anti-democratic, but even if they do it, they often do it at least in name of democracy. And so if you think, for example, about T Trump at the moment with his steal the election, right? His argument is not we should abolish democracy. His argument is we should save democracy, even though if you don't live in his conspiracy theories, what he actually is doing is fundamentally undermining the core aspect of democracy. So, so the dividing line is really between those who, in one form or another, accept the electoral process and, and those who believe it should be replaced by a different principle of leadership. Is, is that how you, is that a fair description? Yes, yes. That's, so that's the core aspect, the core division between radical and extreme. Now, I haven't, the, I haven't discussed nativism. So nativism is a, a kind of a xenophobic form of nationalism. It means that you want a monocultural state, you want a state only for your nation, and that you perceive anything that is non-native or alien as threatening. And those are both people and ideas. Nativism can be radical, but it can also be extreme. I mean, the Nazis were a good example of extremist nativism, whereas Parties like Front National or Austrian Freedom Party are a form of radical nativism. Um, and nativism can be populist or elitist. Um, so they're all connected, like, and they kind of come together in the far right, but there are different, there are different um, aspects of it. 
And, and the most toxic mix, I guess, is when these various elements combine in, in the form of a single movement. Um, and um, just following on, 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 on your latest comment, uh, nationalism, or more particularly nativism, seemed germane to many of the far-right movements that you've studied and written about. Um, so against this background, can we nevertheless speak of a global far-right, or is global and far-right a contradiction in terms, given their nativist uh, principles? So for example, uh, Steve Bannon's failure to establish a far-right international, is that an indication that it's simply impossible to herd these cats? Or did his incompetence fail where others might succeed? I think a bit of both, to be honest. Um, I mean, definitely Steve Bannon is by and large incompetent in, in international politics and also completely underestimated the anti-American sentiment of many Europeans and particularly the radical right. Um, so for Americans in general, there's this idea that the far right started with Trump. Um, and so they think that Trump was particularly successful and, and now they can teach the rest of the world how to how to become far right. And for the Europeans, they've been, I mean, they've been they reasonably successful. <laughs> right. And, and so they're like, we, we already were relevant in the 1990s and the early 2000s. Like we don't need an American to teach us like how to, how to run our affairs. And that was a sentiment that was pretty widespread within the far right. And so it, 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 it had a lot to do with just Bannon. And Bannon actually didn't ever have any resources connected to people who are completely marginal within the European far right. But there is also something ideologically, of course, like it's really only, I would say, the, 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 the truly communist left that has an ideological incentive for global cooperation. Um, even more center left parties and center right parties are, are still national first. They might not be nationalists, but they're national. First. Now, of course, nationalist parties are first and foremost about their own country, but that doesn't make them blind to having common enemies. And there is quite a lot of solidarity across nationalists and, and has always been. Where it becomes tricky is often when countries border. And so Slovak nationalists and Hungarian nationalists fight over a part of territory as do Serbians and, and Croats. On top of that, nationalists and nativists have a lot of, of prejudices. Um, and so, a few de about a decade and a half ago, the co collaboration of far right parties in the European Parliament kind of broke over the fact that the Italians made all kind of like prejudiced remarks about Romanians, even though they kind of meant what they meant was Roma. Um, but they conflate the two. But the Romanian far right, of course, despised the Roma and despised the fact that they are being. Um, equated to Roma and so that group split and that is something that you see but that doesn't mean that they cannot selectively co collaborate as long as they share the, the same enemy. And um, looking more at, at their um, political agendas, uh, the extreme right seems to experience its greatest growth in response to crisis and particularly um, significant economic dislocation. But rather than putting forward a coherent economic agenda, um, like many uh, leftist movements do, these uh, far right movements tend to focus on culture wars, identity politics, and xenophobia and racism. How do you explain this? Is this um, part of the explanation, is part of the explanation that such movements tend to have and seek sponsors and supporters from among the most wealthy? No, I think not everything in politics is strategic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and so we have this tendency of, of this rational choice explanation of that, that politicians are kind of political entrepreneurs and they just look at where they can, where they can win. Right. But actually, there are people who believe in stuff. And, and so while there are more than enough opportunists in politics, you're, you're the general leadership of far-right parties 
like the Le Pens or like the leadership of the AFD and others, they believe, like they believe that that a, a homogenous nation is is the only pure form of society and, and, and it's the strongest and the securest. And, and so for them, as traditionally for conservatives, economics is secondary. Um, and if your nation gets wealthier through immigration, right, they will still say no, because wealth is not as important as purity of the nation. And so I think, I think that's very important to, to understand. At the same time, like they use economic arguments, right? And say, well, they take our jobs or, or they milk our welfare state. But even that for them is for the leaders is kind of secondary because they're keeping- And it's tied is- very much to their primary principle as well. Exactly. And so this, what we call welfare chauvinism, this, this argument that far right supports a welfare state, but only for the own people and, and makes immigrants out as a threat to the welfare state or parasites of it. That is very popular among the electorate. And it is central to the, to the messaging of the far right. But the economic argument always remain secondary for the far right. And so in, in, in that sense, the, this is not about how to make your coalition as big as possible. This is really about what you all believe in. They truly believe that the core of society, of life is the nation and the nation is an, an essentialist being that, that, is, that can mix because it weakens. I mean, that part I understand, but I'm I'm still nevertheless a little surprised that these movements and leaders don't recognize that, in a sense, it was economic crisis um, um, that gave them a real shot in the arm. And then they don't try, in addition to the principles that you've enumerated, they don't try to develop coherent economic programs that would presumably help substantially increase um, their own support, particularly those who are contesting elections. No, I I get that. Although I think there's a a very, very strong misunderstanding about this uh, idea that economic crises lead to the success of the far right. This is all based uh, almost exclusively on one case, a traditional case, which is Weimar Germany. Um, But we have to remember that first of all, Hitler never won the majority of the vote. Like at best, he, he got a third of the vote. He came to power because of opportunistic uh, <coughs> coalition politics of, right. of mainstream parties. But more importantly, there were elections in other countries. There were not many democracies at that point in time. But in all of these other countries, also hard hit by the Great Depression, the far right didn't do anything. And what we see since is, for example, one of the biggest economic crises in the post-war period was the oil crisis. 1970s. 1973 didn't do anything for the far right. Um, The far right emerged in the 1990s, primarily in countries that did really well, like Austria, very low unemployment, Belgium, very low unemployment. And even today does really well in some of the richest parts like Scandinavia. So at best, this is about relative deprivation, Mm -hmm. about people who are not poor, but who are poorer than either they were or than other people. So economic Um, insecurity. It, it, well, it's status anxiety. Um, And and that is a bit different because it's not not so much about your absolute position, it's about your relative position in society. And and status anxiety would probably combine very well with with xenophobia and and, uh, and nativism. Absolutely, because then the idea is that like, so what you actually see among some supporters of the far right, particularly in countries that are that are pro-capitalist like the US, there's not much state things, there's not much resentment towards the rich mm-hmm. um, because they're associated with hard work. Mm-hmm. There is resentment to a certain group of rich people, mostly bankers, because they're seen as parasites. They don't produce anything. They are not the job creators. And at the other end, there is a, a, a absolute prejudice and, and, and dislike of so-called paras- parasites of society 
which in the discourse of not just the far right, but more broadly, is quite often racialized. And so right. these are the groups that, even though numerically, they're almost always predominantly the native population, like disproportionately at times, these are racialized minorities. And so that, that is where the two come together. And that, and that often plays into, um, uh, let's say, traditional anti-Semitic uh, tropes of Jewish bankers and globalists and George Soros and so on. Yeah, and so this is in part, um, and, and it depends because anti, anti-Semitism is much less um, important these days than it, than it was in the 30s, of course. And it has come back a little bit with the George Soros trope, although even in those cases, it, it, it is kind of hidden. It's kind of a dark whistle, right? Mm-hmm. But yes, there is this idea that elites are manipulating immigration for their own purpose, right? right? And whether these elites are the Jews, which is in a minority of cases, or the left, Mm-hmm. Like it, it that that doesn't matter. But there is this idea that there's something bigger going on. Right. And um, following on that, so in in one form or another, the far right is currently in power or sharing power in several European states: Brazil, India, Israel, and recently also, as you mentioned, in the United States. So, in your view, is it? an ascendant global force? Or do you believe it has reached its peak and is now in decline? And related to that, should we focus primarily on the performance um, and gains of of such movements? Or should we instead um, look more closely at the extent to which the agendas of these far-right movements and their policies are co-opted by more mainstream political parties? Now, let me start with the second. I think this has always been one of my big frustrations. Um, we tend to externalize the far right to those outside of the mainstream, which also means that parties that are classically far right, when they become mainstream, that they're seen no longer as far right. And, and then we start to call them populist, for example. Um, and, and soon we, we come up with terms like national conservative. Um, even though their ideology hasn't changed, just their power has changed. Um, I think as a liberal Democrat, like our concern should be about ra- radical right policies. It's not about the actors, it's about the policies mm-hmm. first and foremost. And so I rather have a radical right party implementing liberal democratic policies than an ostensibly liberal democratic party implementing radical right part, uh, policies. <clears throat> that being said, like, um, we know of radical right parties that leave them to their own devices, they're going to implement radical right policies. Right. Whereas we don't necessarily know that with the far, with, with mainstream parties, it's also while there has been significant mainstreaming of uh, the far right, even, even someone like me who's extremely critical about, about the mainstream right, you cannot, you have, still have to acknowledge that Austria being led by courts is bad, but Austria being led by the FPO would be far worse. Right. The Netherlands being led by Rutte is, in my opinion, really bad, but the Netherlands being led by Baudet would be a complete and utter disaster, right? And so there are gradations, but there, it's not black and white. Like you cannot say there's one nativist, like one source of nativism and the rest is non-nativist. That's just not true anymore. Um, and so I think that is that is very important. Now with regard oh, sorry, to- Sorry, if I can just follow up on that. So do I understand correctly, you're not um, particularly convinced by this argument that what mainstream right-wing parties are doing is stealing the thunder of, of the far right in order to outperform them electorally? Is, is that what, how I should understand your point? I mean, a lot of political science research shows that, that that simply isn't the case. And I think what we're seeing is that it's a little bit the same as when, when the social Democrats took over, uh, like adopted the pro-market policies. Mm-hmm. Like, and so they stole the funder of the center right for a bit. Like, for a decade and a half mm-hmm. and then fell apart. I think the I think the mainstream right is going that, that same way. 
Interesting. Um, mm. And you see it already in the countries that started first, like Denmark, for example. Mm. Um, you, I think we're going to see it in the Netherlands. You see it to a certain extent in Austria. Of course, scandals play a role, but that's also part of like adopting these type of policies. Um, so I, I think that 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 is that that is inevitable. Now, whether they peaked or not, there are two there are two parts to this story. Like the first part is, are there are there are these type of attitudes are far right policies becoming more popular or not? And that, that's not true. They become less popular. Under Trump, for example, support for immigration has has grown a lot. Um, the D- during immigration. Trump's period in office, yes. Hmm. And, and this is part generational change. I mean, the younger generations are just much more at ease with diversity. Yeah. Um, that being said, our democratic systems are not fully democratic for a variety of reasons. Many have disproportional electoral systems. And in other cases, only as, I mean, we know that old people vote far more than young people. So as a consequence, the far right can still in the coming years, despite going down in terms of overall support for policies, be very successful in elections, either because they by and large create a political system, electoral system that that disproportionately favors them like in Hungary or or the US, or because the youth doesn't vote and the right vote and the older vote and the older vote increasingly on the basis of social cultural issues. Interesting. Yeah. And um, looking at a different aspect of the of the far right, people typically associate it with the fascist regimes of the 20th century. And my understanding is that these were broadly secular um, and even anti-clerical uh, in many respects. Yet many of today's movements are marked by an emphasis on religion, ritual and piety. Is this indeed a substantial change? And if it is, what in your view explains it? Uh, I'm not so sure. So in the 1920s, 30s, um, Italian fascism was, yes, secular and to a certain extent anti-clerical, as was national socialism. However, Germany. in Germany, but the Italian fascists, by and large, as a regime, made a deal with the Catholic Church. <clears throat> and even the, the much more militant German Nazi regime, by and large, made deals with whatever church that wanted to, to work with them. On top of that, there were clerical fascist regimes in, in uh, Slovakia and in Croatia. In Spain, the fascists were very close to, to Catholicism. Sure. Um, there are some mystic Orthodox uh, fascists in Romania. So there were actually different forms. And I think we see that as well today. I also think that the vast majority of far right um, movements today are secular. Mm-hmm. Um, and they do they do refer to religion, but in a cultural way. And so for them, for example, Flemish are by definition Catholic. That doesn't mean you go to church. Like it doesn't mean you follow the Bible. It's, yeah. it's part of the identity. Mm. And this has been played up more because the enemy has changed. Like before 9-11, the enemy was an ethno-nationalist and national enemy. It was the Turk. It was the Moroccan. Mm. Because of 9-11, it became an ethno-religious uh, mm. enemy, the Muslim. And if you pred- predominantly define your enemy in ethno-religious terms, you have to deal with that in some way or another um, with yourself. But think about Front National, for example, Rassemblement National now, which is very strongly like supporting laicite, is very strong secular state. Um, Geert Wilders in the Netherlands is still predominantly secular, um, begrudgingly now accepts kind of Christianity because it is an, an ally in its like in its fight. Um, but then you have Poland, you have, of course, the U.S., where Christianity and nationalism are, are closely mixed, Bolsonaro as well. So we have a variety. Um, but I wouldn't say that in particularly Western Europe, religion is, is really a core aspect of the far right. Well, I, perhaps um, the U.S., you also mentioned Poland and Brazil, but I think the U.S. in particular would then be 
kind of, if not an anomaly, at least at least a case study where um, nativism and, and religion um, have been fused very closely, and that perhaps reflects the particular historical trajectory of the United States. Yeah, I, I think this is actually a very interesting issue. And pretty much until the storming of the Capitol on January 6th, um, Christianity was almost written out of the story of Trumpism. Mm -hmm. um, and that had a lot to do with Trump, I think. Um, Trump himself clearly not being a religious man. Um, and I'm barely making statements about Christianity. But his core support right, definitely comes from white evangelicals. And what we saw, particularly at the storming of the Capitol, was like uh, people praying, uh, making references to, to Christ. And it, clearly, religion played a major role. And since then, I think there's been a lot more um, emphasis on what is here called Christian nationalism. Mm -hmm. But there were also have been studies already for quite a while that, that have always argued that this rise of the Christian right in the in the 70s and <clears throat> early 80s, which was seen always about Roe v. Wade, about the abortion issue, right? That it was actually very closely related to the desegregation movement right. too. And that racism was always at the core of grassroots Christian right. And of the back door, um, the back door uh, entry point to desegregation by shifting the emphasis to uh, cultural issues like abortion rights and so on. Exactly, because by and large, they led to the same type of things, namely right. control over schools. Right. Mm. Um, turning to the other side of the equation, you, you earlier referred to the disintegration of, of mainstream social democratic parties in Europe. But if we look at the situation today, um, why have both the mainstream and progressive left failed to formulate an effective response to the radical right? And here I'm talking not so much about, let's say, the, the polemical or policy level, but in terms of something um, that is actually succeeding in practice. It seems that while the far right grows with every election, social democratic parties, as you mentioned, are disintegrating while their more progressive counterparts remain comparatively marginal. Now, I think it's important to note that, that no one mm -hmm. really came up with a good um, counter to, to the far right. Um, the mainstream right pretty much just adopted the agenda and, and that is why for a while they've been successful. But I, for the, during the 1980s and most of the 1990s, mainstream parties made an either explicit or implicit pact um, not to campaign on issues that were controversial, um, particularly immigration and European integration. Um, and they really have since followed um, the far right by either, by either adopting them or just responding, reacting negatively to them, but they still haven't developed their own Christian democratic, liberal or social democratic vision on multicultural societies, which are a reality, or on European integration. Um, and these are closely connected for, for far-right success. <clears throat> and so um, I, think, I think this is one of the key problems and I've said it quite often, there's an ideological vacuum at the heart of liberal democracy. We have policies, but we don't really have visions. Um, and we have policies and slogans that are barely supported. So our reality is still a reality of European integration, of multicultural societies, and of neoliberal economics. And yet there's no, almost not a party anymore that supports openly these three. Almost all of these three are being said to have failed by all mainstream politicians, right? Now, how can that be inspiring to anyone? And so I think that it, it's a challenge for liberal democratic parties to come up with their own ideas about why these things are good and how they should be reformed in line with their own ideology. Um, now, why has the left been so dismal? I think, I, to be honest, I do not fully know. I think that 
we have to give some more thought about the importance of the end of the Cold War and what that what that meant for the left and for the stigma on the left. Obviously, it has to do with a, a right wing turn within and, and a, a pragmatic turn in in the in center left. Right? It's not just about accepting the market. It's actually rejecting ideology. I mean, uh, Tony Blair was very explicit about this and Wim Kok as well and, and like uh, Schroeder. And so I, I want to see an ideological restart of social democracy, not on the basis of like policies, on the basis of ideals. And then you get to policies. Um, I do believe that actually there is a, a massive support for it. But at the moment, like <clears throat> most of the center left is vanilla. Mm -hmm. Like it is, it is to centrist for left wing people, nice. and it is to certain to centrist for right wing people too. And so, what do you see? You see that the Greens are winning in certain parts. You see that the so called radical left is winning in Denmark or or in Norway. Um, and they, they, they seem to have more clarity in their agenda than exactly than exactly i mean what what do most center left parties these days stand for like they what they mostly argue is that they're not as right wing as the right wing I mean, that's not a right. policy right. so but if i were to ask you to um uh gaze into your crystal ball um do you see in the coming years that it will be um more clearly um parties with more clear agendas like the Greens and and the radical left that will continue to gain? Or do you feel that perhaps more mainstream social democratic parties can perhaps overcome these issues that you've just mentioned, you know, the reactive politics and, and, and third way and so on, and perhaps develop a more um, coherent uh, res response, which is not only you know, reactive in nature, but sets forth clear agendas of its own, which, as you mentioned, has very substantial popular support in many of these societies. I mean, as a crystal ball watcher, like I'm terrible, um, but I don't, I don't directly see a trend. I think, particularly in terms of elections, right? Because what we forget is that elections are are just really national. Like mm -hmm. there are global trends, but every single election, 80% is just national. And so government parties tend to lose, right? I mean, this is one of those. And, Iron law of uh, politics. <laughs> and so when you look at the last elections, the last four, five, six elections in Europe, uh, you, you, they go up and down. But on average, like government parties lose, opposition uh, parties win. Um, so I think the biggest challenge to the left is, is their fragmentation. Um, but fragmentation is also really the story of European politics today. Yeah. Overall. And, and mm -hmm. Overall. And this is very normal because we have at least a free dimensional political space. We have a socioeconomic left, right? Mm -hmm. We have a kind of social cultural left right of authoritarian versus libertarian and then we have kind of a, a, a nationalist versus internationalist cosmopolitan divide and they don't map that yeah. well together mm -hmm. which which means that you have like nine different positions that you can get out of that and i think the fragmentation is here to stay and so this idea of like bringing a your social democratic party back to 30 40 percent it, it that's not happening not in the cards but, yeah. but you can get a social democratic party of, of 15, 20% again, which would make you in many systems in the coming 10 years, the second, third biggest party. Um, but I'm not sure that many of the current social democratic parties will be able to do that with a truly left-wing agenda for the simple reason that you have to just think the people who are now making the policies for the future, they're in their late 30s, early 40s, when they joined social democracy, they joined a social democracy of the Blairism. Right. That's what they think social democracy is. They'll be around and, for a while. <laughs> exactly. And so the old tradition of what 
social democracy was when I grew up in the 70s, right, is now seen as radical left. Right. Um, and so, and the radical left has its own issues. I mean, many of the radical left parties today are, are rooted in, in truly radical left kind of Maoist parties or, or communist parties with all kinds of problems in their internal structures. They're unattractive often to, to young people. Um, and so I think we, we're going to see a fragmentation going forward with, with radical left, green, and, and social democratic parties in many systems being roughly equally big going up and down. What is important is that they start to understand that this is the reality and that they might be electoral competitors, but they're political allies. And they have to find a better reason to divide that. And so it makes sense that the, that, that the Greens have a stronger environmental agenda, right? Mm -hmm. And that's fine. That doesn't mean that the social Democrats shouldn't have a stronger uh, environmental agenda, but it will be different than mm -hmm. the Greens, right? And they should emphasize that clearly. Um, finally, the, the focus of your research has been on Europe and North America, and that's primarily what we've been um, discussing today. But having said that, and given the focus um, of, of this program, in your view, what lessons does your research hold for the Middle East and particularly for uh, progressive forces in the Middle East? Uh, I think there's a, I mean, there's a lot going on in the Middle East at the moment. And in part, they have very different issues. I and mean, even if they have the same issues like immigration or security, they have them for a very, from a very different perspective. Right. Um, I think um, I think it, it, there is a general lesson always to be learned, and that and that is progressive politics should be progressive, and like it, the organization should not be more important than the goal. And I think that is what particularly the lesson of social democratic parties is. They they have adapted to survive as an institution but mm -hmm. not as a social democratic party, like just as the institution. And, it, and in the end, it won't save you, but more importantly, it definitely won't save social democracy. Um, I think on the other hand, there's also a lesson to be learned, what we can learn from, from countries like Tunisia or that, that other countries can learn from, from us. We're now in the West, like Europe and, and North America, we're, we're in a struggle that many, progressives have been fighting in, in the Middle East for a while. And that is, there are two struggles. There's a struggle uh, for democracy in which you have pretty much the, the autocratic forces in power and the rest. And then there's a struggle of what would be the best politics. Generally, th that, is, that comes after because first you need a democracy to, to fight among yourselves. Now, ideally, you fight with all the Democrats against the non-Democrats. The problem is in many countries, the Democrats are not strong enough. They can't do it alone. And so the question has always been, can you work together with other groups that fundamentally are, are against what you stand for, but share their dislike of the autocrat, right? This is what is in Hungary at the moment, the issue, right? Where the democratic opposition works together with Jobbik, which is still, I believe, a far-right party, but they hate Orban. And so for Jobbik, there is an incentive to get the liberal democratic system back, mm -hmm. which they then might want to like destroy, but in the first run, they're an ally. And, and I believe that the Hungarian opposition should work with Jobbik because the first struggle is to keep or, or get back the liberal democratic system. That's why I understand why in North Africa, uh, progressive forces work together with Islamist forces um, to, to create a democratic system. But it is important to keep your eye on the ball, right? And, and understand that you can't compromise on everything um, and that these are your temporary allies. Mm -hmm. um, with limited <laughs> objectives. Allies. With limited objectives, but it's also important that your, that your struggle over, for example, whether your wages are increased by two, two bucks is a different priority than your struggle over whether your system is democratic or not. 
Right. Professor uh, Gosmede, thank you very much for sharing your expertise and insights uh, with us on Connections. Thank you. It was my pleasure.